Okay, hi everyone. Um, we're going to begin with uh, our first participant paper, Professor Ronald Edsforth. He is a distinguished senior lecturer in the History Department at Dartmouth College and Professor of Globalization Studies in the Master of Liberal Studies graduate program. He will present his paper entitled On the Definition of Capitalism and Its Implications for the Current Global Political Economic Crisis. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ronald Edsforth. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be first uh, among the participants. I'm very happy to be here. The morning session was terrific, very stimulating. I look forward to the conversations we'll have during the next few days. Uh, you're supposed to start with a joke, you know. So uh, I, I thought of one while I was listening to Ambassador Jamal's wonderful lecture. He said there are two kinds of people in the world, colored and people without color. I look around the world and in the mirror and I see pink people. And I think uh, pink people are colored people, actually. Uh, but my, my paper is uh, designed to give you some sort of theoretical uh, ideas about the dilemma the world is in right now. And that will help you recognize that the dilemma the world's in right now is not a new dilemma. It's one that the world has been in several t at least several times since the early 19th century. So let's see, I want you for this. I can actually get in 15 minutes. Most arguments about capitalism and the desirability of enacting in economic and social reforms suffer from a faulty thinking that follows from flawed ahistorical definitions of the word capitalism. In the interest of improving intellectual and political discussions of capitalism and finding solutions to the current global and economic crisis, I offer the following definitional thoughts, historical observations, and logical implications. This is the most important thought. Uh, capitalism is not a structure or a system. Capitalism is a logic capable of transforming the world in itself. That's the key thought. It's a logic. Capitalism is not natural. It's a product of history, a human invention, not a set of natural laws discovered by the men venerated as the founders of modern economics, people like Adam Smith and David Ricardo and so forth. Capitalist logic is neither moral or immoral. It's amoral. No society has ever organized all of its human relationships and institutions according to the logic of capitalism. Therefore, there is a great variety among societies that employ capitalist logic. Canada, Norway, France, Japan, and Brazil, and the United States are all called capitalist societies, but they differ greatly in the extent to which capitalist logic is used to organize economic activity, social institutions, and human relationships. China is a one-party communist state that nevertheless uses capitalist logic to organize much of the economic life of its people. All attempts to impose the totality of capitalist logic, a human invention, on society are by definition idealistic and utopian. Therefore, they always evoke a simultaneous resistance from groups in society who, has, who have not embraced capitalist logic. All attempts to impose the logic of capitalism on any part of society require a great deal of government activity aimed at establishing and maintaining neo new capitalist practices as well as the constant suppression or co-optation of those opposed to the new practices. Therefore, there's no such thing as a laissez-faire government. Historically, the primary sources of resistance to the imposition of capitalist logic have been groups and institutions committed to alternative social logics, including religious logics, paternalistic logics, and socialist logics. These same political fault lines between proponents of capitalism attempting to further the imposition of capitalist logic on global society and groups committed to alternative social logics have appeared across the globe since the 1980s. Like capitalist logic, Religious, paternalistic, and socialist logic have their own histories. They differ from capitalist logic in many fundamental ways. But most importantly, they all construct human beings as social beings who have moral obligations to each other. Socialist logics, there are more than one, just as there are more than one religious and paternalistic logics, start with the moral premise, from each according to his abilities to each according to their needs. Socialist logics inform the contemporary political economic practices of what are sometimes called mixed economies, welfare states, or social democracies. The most important fundamental pr principle of capitalist logic is that anything real or imagined can be constructed as a commodity. Commodification precedes market exchange. 
Without commodities, there can be no capitalist markets. Capitalist commodities can and do include clean water, dirty air, clean water, dirty water, clean soil, polluted soil, human health, body parts, genes, life itself, as well as human activity, including le labor, leisure, and sexual intercourse. There are no moral restraints on the creation of commodities. Capitalist logic does not permit the assignation of intrinsic values to commodities, including human life and health. There are markets for murder and weapons of mass destruction, as well as for life-saving drugs and the construction of healthy human habitats. Capitalist logic establishes the value of communities and markets where sellers and buyers establish prices, the money measure of the value of commodities. Buy low and sell high is the fundamental principle of profit-making in capitalist markets. According to capitalist logic, commodities including money that cannot find buyers have no value. That same logic defines exchanges of commodities as good if profits result and as bad if they do not. Here in the capitalist marketplace, the terms good and bad have no moral content. Regulation or suppression of markets in the name of fairness, human rights, human health, and environmental protection cannot spring from capitalist logic. Political society regulates capitalism by imposing a moral logic on the production of and exchange of commodities that exploit, endanger, or degrade human beings and the natural environment. The legitimacy of private ownership and of private ownership of property and profit mag maximization are other essential elements of capitalist logic. Capitalist logic defines human beings not as social beings, but rather as individuals motivated by self-interest. Capitalist rationality is premised on self-interest, not social obligations, moral commitments, or altruism. In the capitalist way of thinking, each of us owns ourself as property. In other words, each of us is essentially an individual alienated from all others. When constructed using capitalist logic, a people's freedom liberty depends on obtaining and preserving full ownership of oneself. Historically, in many societies where some people were once or still are owned as property by other people, the local definition is derived from recognizing what it means not to be a slave. According to capitalist logic, in order to live and have self-respect, many people, including most adults, children, and the elderly, should sell parts of their lives by the hour, the day, the week, the month, the year, etc., in labor markets. These labor market transactions means the sellers of their labor power are less free than those who do not have to sell parts of their lifetime. Since the rich possess more of this kind of liberty than most people, they evoke a variety of responses among the non-rich in capitalist societies. These responses include anger and resentment, envy and adulation, and even attempts at emulation via unwise borrowing and theft. Behaviors such as conspicuous consumptions of things that have a high price market value but no real use value reflect the internalization of capitalist logic by many people in modern capitalist societies who themselves are not capitalists. You'll probably recognize that Thorsten Veblen saw this in the United States in 1899 and wrote the book Theory of the Leisure Class. Conspiction of consum cons conspicuous consumption is a primary characteristic of economic globalization and a major reason for the disconnect between global economic growth and other global measures of human well-being. So in other words, in terms of social diplomacy and reaching good human outcomes, there's a disconnect between promoting conspicuous consumption of modern type that was founded in America and realizing human security and human development for most people in the world. Capitalist commodities include time itself. As the leading capitalist of his day said, and this was Ben Franklin, time is money. The money value of time is now measured in nanoseconds. According to capitalist logic, free time that is not spent in market activities or preparing commodities, including human capital, for sale in a market is wasted time. This explains the rise of uh, multitasking and the rise in work time over recent generations. We've all been wasting our time only doing one thing at a time. We could actually do two things at a time and increase profits for the companies we work for. Uh, the widespread use of the term human capital, an insidious term as I see it, reflects the deep penetration of capitalist logic 
in America and other Western societies. The logic of human capital development is the logic of developing a commodity for sale in a market, the labor market. Human capital development has undermined the original mission of liberal education, the full development of human talents and moral character, and substituted for it the main purpose of education, the preparation of students for sale of themselves in particular labor markets. Overemphasis on human capital development may leave educated people of the 21st century intellectually and morally impoverished. Business history is primarily the history of changes in capitalism itself that stem from the imaginative use of capitalist logic. The imaginative invention and sale of various new kinds of financial commodities, in the past securities like debt instruments, bonds, and claims on ownership stocks, and most recently derivatives, collateralized mortgage debt, and credit swap defaults create financial instability. Great finance, and this describes our current crisis, great financial crises occur when the understanding of the implications of recently invented financial commodities lags far behind the rapid growth of markets for these commodities. This explained what happened in the 1890s, the 1930s, and since 2007. The experts don't know what happened because they didn't understand the implications of the financial commodities that were being exchanged. Crises in capitalist markets and insecurity, and the insecurity, unemployment, and poverty they create always promote resistance to the application of capitalist logic in society and the economy. Since the late 19th century, financial crises have always promoted the growth of a political left committed to socialist and progressive logics that demand especially fairness, especially for those with the fewest resources. Financial crises have also always, always promoted the growth of a political right committed to the logic of fundamentalist religions and or ethnic communalism. These groups usually insist on a restoration of traditional values as the way out of the crisis. Understanding the amoral logic of today's global free market capitalist institutions, so free market in quotes, and the moral logics of their current op op opponents, for instance, in the Occupy movements and among social and religious conservatives around the world, helps to clarify what is really at stake in the current crisis. One more set of points. The imaginative application of capitalist logic also explains the evolution of the firm from the individual and family-owned business and partnerships of the 15th century to transnational corporations of the 20th century. Controlling markets for commodities to push up prices or keep them from falling has been a characteristic of capitalism itself since its creation in early modern Europe. In other words, actual businessmen don't like competition because it pushes uh, uh, costs, uh, prices down below costs, and they fail. The history of capitalist business reveals the continuous development of de facto and de jure practices that protect individual capitalists, partnerships, and companies from the unpredictability and volatility of markets, monopolies, oligopolies, cartels, licenses, copyrights, and patents are some examples of this ever-present characteristic of the actual practice of capitalism. Large transnational corporations and banks are among the most powerful non-state actors in the 21st century. Establishments of markets that actually operated according to the principles of free market economic logic is not in their best interest, and they don't try to promote that. Final point. The political economic crises that have emerged in most of the world will not be solved by the strict application of capitalist logic. Reforms sensitive to the religious, paternalistic, socialist logics of particular people in particular places must be developed to blunt the amoral and utopian project of the free marketeers. There is no one-size-fits-all global solution to our problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Edsforth.